And it's a pleasure to introduce Lauren Campbell, who's a colleague of ours here at Western in the Department of Psychology. He joined in a, in a reading group we had last year that was focusing on these issues. So it was terrific to get to know him then. And he'll be closing out the conference with teaching good science by conducting close replication. Thank you very much for uh, having me here today. I've enjoyed the talks today. I just unfortunately had to miss the first uh, uh, two days. What I'm going to be talking about is an assignment. Well, I'll have some background to it, but there's an assignment that I created in a graduate research methods class that I teach. Instead of having the random write me a research paper, I thought let's make something more useful and kind of help teach more open, reproducible scientific practices in the lab, but do so kind of through the back door by working on conducting a replication study uh, where the students themselves get to uh, pick and choose something that they're very interested in that's relevant to their own research and then we work with the original authors, and I'll talk about the, the assignment later, and actually collect data, and then continue to work together when the class is over to collect uh, more data sets, and then ultimately to publish them. And I'll say, so far, out of five uh, group projects, all five of them have been published in, uh, in scientific journals. Well, one is about to come out, but it's been accepted. So there's been a 100% success rate so far that I hope to carry on into uh, next uh, winter. And just as a fun kind of anecdotal story to lighten the mood here for a moment, I've I'm a social psychologist. I study relationship processes, and we often have very large data sets collected over a large period of time with behavioral data and lots of variables. There's a lot going on, and I have a lot of colleagues, when I talk to them about more open and reproducible scientific practices, I'll be like, well, I can't really, I don't really know exactly what I'm going to find going into a study. And I'm like, well, that's fair. But interestingly enough, whenever I read your papers, I always see as predicted. Uh, so it's like, <laughs> how could that be possible that you say, I cannot possibly state in advance what I expect to find, yet every paper of yours I read, uh, you seem to be very good at predicting things. Uh, so uh, again, that's just more of a, a funny joke, and usually it's as predicted after I saw the data. Uh, so. Each press. Oh, it's just for pointing, okay. So you may all be familiar with the, well, maybe you are not, the sitcom, The Big Bang Theory, a bunch of geeky uh, kind of physicist kids or, uh, or young adults live together. And Leonard, his mom visits, and he's like, hey, fine, let's go. I think you'll find my work pretty interesting. I'm attempting to replicate the dark matter signal found in sodium iodide crystals by the Italians. So uh, his mom, no original research then? <laughs> and he's like, uh, no. She's like, well, what's the point of my seeing? I could just go read the paper the Italians wrote. Uh, the idea there being, I could, the joke is that we don't always value replication research for a lot of different reasons. And when I talk about replication, yes, I'll, there's fine-grained distinctions between, say, direct or conceptual, but it's not just a uh, 50 or you know, black and white. There's a lot of gradations in between. Uh, but we don't always value it. In our field in particular, we hardly ever do those types of replications. Uh, and if we do, they're very rarely published. Some work in 2012 uh, looked at a subset of the literature uh, for a certain period of years and found that apparently, say, 1% or so of the research was published was actually considered a direct replication. And those were off often usually conducted by the same authors uh, that published the original study. So there's not a lot of cross-lab replication. Now, of course, you know, we talked about Feynman earlier, and he talks about... Uh, how this young student came to his lab, and she was in the psychology department studying rat behavior, and had a, a new idea. And he said to her, well, I think what you should actually do is run the original study, see if you can replicate it, and then change the conditions and expand on that and go from there. And I guess she came back and said, well, I was excited about that, but I told my advisor, my advisor suggested that that's already been done, it'd be a waste of time to, to do that, and we just need to go right on to uh, the conceptual replication. And of course he says, you know, this was about 1935 or so, seems to have been the general policy then to not try to repeat psychological experiments, but only to change the conditions and see what happens. And he of course thought that that was not an ideal approach to scientific uh, discovery. Not that you have to replicate every single thing, but uh, in this case it wasn't the <laughs> ideal approach. And I'll say, even up till not many, uh, a few years ago, that is very much the approach in, in uh, the field of psychology or social psychology uh, as it stands, is to, if someone else has already done it, then yeah, they've done it, build on that and move from there and change the circumstances uh, instead of trying to directly replicate. But that's changing a little bit now. 
While we do place more value on new findings, I was at a grant writing panel years ago, just after I finished graduate school, and the person giving the discussion said, you need to be first. You need to be the first one studying something. And if someone else has already done it, you need to be the first to be second. Uh, the point is, you need to show that what you're doing is a novel, unique contribution. I'm sure we've all heard, you know, groundbreaking studies. And of course, the other analogy, well, you do, everyone's doing groundbreaking studies. We have a lot of, you know, holes in the ground, but not a lot of buildings. Uh, but the, we do place a lot of value on novelty and uh, things that are kind of unique, and in many cases, counterintuitive. Like, ah, I wouldn't have expected that. Uh, and so we value novelty more than, say, mundane findings. We overinterpret, at times, the strength of evidence for rejecting the null hypothesis when a p-value is less than 0.05. This is, of course, focusing on null hypothesis significance testing, where in our field we've uh, typically adopted the standard of the threshold of p less than 0.05, and if we get a p-value of less than 0.05, it's like, good, it's the, you know, we, we have something significant, let's move on. Sometimes that can be overinterpreted, and as has been shown with some simulations uh, and so on, our often our, P, our alpha level really isn't 0.05. Uh, it can actually be inflated quite a bit, particularly when we're conducting uh, many, many statistical tests, or actually using the p-value itself to, to determine what we should be looking at versus saying, here's what we're looking at, and let's see what the p-value is, uh, which are very different research processes. Okay, what did I say here? Cohen's D of 0 0.80, which is a large effect size, is very impressive, unless, of course, the sensitivity of that effect is all the way from 0 0.01 to 1.59. And you'll see uh, findings in the published literature that are like this. A large effect size, and that's what's discussed. But if you take the information provided and kind of look at the confidence interval around those effect sizes, because oftentimes the N or sample size is fairly low, you'll find that the effect can be something that's absolutely trivial and near zero, or one of the largest effects you've ever seen in the history of social psychology. It could be in, a, in that range, and what we don't know. So we need to look at more of the sensitivity and perhaps focus a little bit less just on a strict cutoff of as P less than 0.05 or not. Now, recent research raises questions regarding replication rates in psychology. I'm not going to talk about what is the rate, because, well, we really don't know, but there has been some interesting research that suggests uh, that, well, here, let me just get to it. Uh, I'll just put something up here, uh, and because I want to talk about some examples. Uh, so Etienne LaBelle created CuratesScience.org. He actually has a Mary Curie award right now, spending two years uh, in Belgium and kind of developing this uh, even more. The website actually is under constant development. But the point is, what he's done so far is curated the effects of over 1,100 published rep uh, direct replication studies in the field of psychology uh, from over 200 and say five effects uh, and, and, and so on. So there's a lot of effects that have been the focus of direct replications, over 1,100 uh, publications. Well, that's just, uh, just what they curated so far. And they make it available. And the idea is not to talk about is something successfully replicated or not, but it's just to say, given the available evidence, when you run the study this way, and you can also show the different labs and so on, and you kind of take a look at the cumulative evidence for that, what is our confidence in the effect, the, the effect and the sensitivity of that effect? So talking less about does the effect exist or not, but given all the available evidence for that, how much confidence do we place in that effect? This is from a study by Barge and Shalev, or, uh, Shalev originally. You can see their N is around 50. And in this research, they found a positive association between uh, trait loneliness and a, a combination of three variables. How many times you shower a week, how warm, the, uh, how warm you like the water in your shower, and how long you shower. The idea being that people that are lonelier will try to make up for it by feeling warm, the warmth embrace of the water in the shower. And they found a very strong correlation in, the, in these sample sizes, and you can see the effect size and the confidence interval. Now, Brent Dolan and his group is actually very interested in this because they're personality psychologists and they've studied loneliness uh, uh, before. And they're like, well, let's see if we can replicate this and expand on it. And you know, using the method section of the paper and talking to the authors, they ran some studies, I believe, and we're finding, as you can see, results that weren't consistent. And then finally, they asked for the data. And this is where things blew up a few years ago uh, because uh, uh, they said, yes, of course you can see our data, but you can't talk about anything publicly about that. 
which, you know, I, I'm not putting any value judgment on that. But then one of the authors wrote a blog post that says, the first rule of John Barge's data is you can't talk about John Barge's data. And I was like, ah. So that's where sometimes you get uh, uh, behaviors uh, from different groups of people that kind of cast a, a, a bad light, perhaps, on, on uh, say, the research process. And we can, why, why focus on that when we can focus on this, right? The data speak for themselves at that point. At least running the study this way uh, suggests that, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't base a master's thesis on this. It, that is what I'm trying to say. Do, could the effect possibly still exist? Like, could it be real? Could it be true? Of course it could be. Uh, it's just doing, studying it this way doesn't yield effects that are consistent uh, with that original hypothesis. Just as another example here, here's one of a successful, well, you could say successful in the sense that uh, most of the participating labs found an effect, that, a signal, and a signal that was consistent with the original, even though the pooled effect size uh, is smaller than the original. But this is from what was called a registered replication report. There are more of them now, where one group of researchers says, I think this study is uh, particularly important to be the, uh, the focus of a replication attempt from not just my lab, but labs all over the world working independently uh, and working with the original authors. And then we'll kind of, we'll, and I've been involved in one, we'll write the paper entirely and no one gets to see the results. Only the data analytic team gets to see the results. And then we get the results and now we can fill in the values in the paper. So all of us are kind of at that point blind to what the, the effects will be. So in this instance, you can see the signal was always consistent with the original. There's no that, none that were inconsistent with it. Uh, and overall, there was, there was an effect. Yes? Well, I uh, like to use this schooler example as a good example of what the perils of replication are, because the original study left off critical control conditions that should have been added. Instead of doing these replications, they should have done it over better including right. the missing control that should have been in the original, but wasn't. Yeah. Well, hindsight bias is uh, you know, pretty, uh, you know, we use that all the time, of course. Reviewers, well, you should have done this, you should have done that. Uh, and I believe it was in this one that they actually had an issue where they started running it, and uh, partway through they realized uh, something was missing, and then they added it to the other one, so they have had two groups of them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, folks will say, well, why are you running it the same way you ran it before? You should build on it. And that is one model. I'm sure that's something that people will look to in the future. It's something that we've done in our own lab when we've done replication studies. And I'll talk about one of those examples uh, here in just a little bit. This, just a couple more examples here, Zhang and Lilinquist. Uh, you can see the original effect and then you can see the different replication attempts. And I also want to highlight something else from uh, this website is all those are links. Where it's available, there are links to the study materials, the data, the code, and all of the R code that you need to rerun all the meta-analyses, including a, 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 an Excel file with all the effect sizes. So in 50 years from now, when maybe Ed Chen is dead and gone and he can't uh, respond to email anymore, you can still get all the information that he used to create this website. Uh, just another one, an example here, a registered replication report, Hart and uh, Alberison. Uh, and you can see the original effect and the confidence intervals, and then of course, all the participating labs here. Uh, and uh, the pooled effect size. I was going to talk about one more, a little more in depth, partly because uh, I was involved in this one, and it was, well, in the, what we did, didn't want to see was the field of relationship science, as it were, kind of be uh, left behind or not be a part of uh, these sorts of attempts, and that's what I, I study. And a, a colleague, Irene Chung, uh, studied forgiveness. And uh, there was a paper published many years ago, 2002, that was the first and only paper to show experimentally that changes in commitment has a causal effect on changes in forgiveness. And this is a very important piece of the investment theory by Carol Ruspel, originally to Bowen Kelly, 1959. Uh, and the idea is if people that are more committed to their partner in the relationship uh, are gonna be more likely to forgive transgressions from the partner. And what they had is an interesting little manipulation where they just had people write five sentences or answer five questions that kind of focused on being committed to their partner. That was the experimental condition. Whereas in the other condition, they had them write sentences that focused more on independence, so away from the partner. And that was considered the low commitment condition. And what they found, as you can see, is an effect size of 1.33, which is very large in statistical terms, for this manipulation. They are effectively able to push people's commitment levels, like their actual commitment to their partner, higher or lower. And uh, 
So that was used as, uh, okay, this has been cited I mean, 500 times or more, partly because it's the only study that shows a cause and effect relation versus correlational associations, which you do find, uh, and we indeed found in this research ourselves, that if, you're more if you say you're more committed, you forgive more. But when we, we worked with the original author very closely in this, he was very helpful, uh, and we had 16 participating labs all over the world, and when we got this back, I have to admit, this was surprising to me. Partly because I thought that the manipulation itself would quote unquote work, but it's, it's essentially zero. Does that mean that I didn't work then? Well, of course not. Uh, it, it very well could have worked just like that. Maybe there's a lot of different reasons for understanding why it isn't working today. But if a student came to me and said, I'm interested in using this manipulation for, to change people's commitment to assess something else, I would say, I don't think that's a valuable use of your time. And that's something we wouldn't have known if we didn't undertake uh, this effort. Uh, they got effects here on what's called exit forgiveness. There's a cool model called exit voice loyalty neglect, ways you can respond to a partner's transgressions. Exit is kind of taking uh, an active approach, but removing yourself from the situation, which is generally perceived to be bad. And what they, what they are able to find is if you prime commitment and make people feel more committed to the relationship, uh, then they are less likely to use this type of forgiveness strategy. Uh, whereas, yeah, we, the, the replication labs weren't as successful. And then lastly, they found that they looked at neglect forgiveness, which is a, a negative form of forgiveness, but neglect, like just shutting down and pretending it didn't happen and walking away. Uh, and uh, you see, again, there's a lot of variability, but the effect size hovering around uh, zero. So in this case, I wouldn't necessarily... <laughs> We don't necessarily use the terms, oh, it failed, it does not replicate, as much as given the available evidence that we have, uh, we're not kind of convinced that this manipulation can cause changes in uh, commitment. Uh, and uh, maybe because of that, we, we weren't able to replicate the other findings. But it does perhaps point uh, people in the, the right direction of considering other ways to manipulate commitment if they wanted to do so. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we might not be able to replicate findings, and a lot of those were talked about here today, and they're all you know, valid uh, possibilities. Uh, one, of course, is, and some, whether you agree with this or not, uh, there are some folks that suggest that publication bias itself is probably one of the, uh, it's probably something that is uh, hurting the scientific progress uh, the most. What do we mean by that? Uh, if you look at what's in psych psychological journals, and you pull out the, this, uh, all the findings that have been published. And this has been done, uh, Sterling in 1959, and again uh, late, later on, and by some others uh, more recently. Approximately 95% of all statistical tests that are reported report statistically significant results in the predicted direction. Uh, so that it kind of suggests that as a lab, we're selectively perhaps writing up statistically significant findings to submit, partly because we know that that's what's going to be more likely to be accepted. So we wait till we have enough of those significant effects uh, to put together into a study package, we write it up, and then, and then we submit that. At the same time, the average statistical power in our field has hovered around 50% and hasn't really changed. So now we have a, an issue where we know that of these uh, findings, where 95% of them are statistically significant in the published literature, we know that there's a lot that are in a file drawer somewhere, or, or in a digital file uh, somewhere that uh, have not been written up. And I already mentioned that part. Uh, I don't like this term. It kind of sounds like you know like something a cat does like behind a couch, you know, <laughs> pee hacking. Using various practices that have been called like QRPs or questionable research practices to obtain a p-value below 0.05. What could that look like? Well, like I just mentioned in my field, relationship science. Uh, I remember when I was an undergrad, I was testing a fairly specific hypothesis, but yet the study, all the uh, uh, questionnaires that are put together by myself and of course my advisor, it took participants one hour to complete all the questions. Uh, so the idea was, well, then you have it, right? You, you know, you, well, you have that measurement. And there were a lot of dependent variables. So now the idea is if you, if you say I have five dependent variables, I don't know which one should work, I wanna check them all, but you check them all, one of them works, and I'm gonna take that one then to discuss it and talk about it. Uh, now, that kind of increases your actual alpha level way above uh, 0.05. Um, and there are a lot of other, you know, uh, collecting data, 10 participants per condition, running an analysis, checking it out. Oh, not significant yet, running 10 more, checking significance, not, you know, and running 10 more. Uh, kind of those, that sort of stopping rule. 
uh, can be shown to actually inflate your alpha level. But there are ways of uh, dealing with that if you want to, called uh, sequential analyses, where you can plan your peaks at the data uh, and therefore keep your alpha level at 0.05 uh, versus uh, hovering uh, above that. And there has been, and I don't want to say, well, a culture of closed science, meaning not sharing, partly because it's been difficult to actually share. I'm old enough to remember in graduate school submitting paper copies of a paper to a journal, putting it in an envelope, writing figure one, figure two in the back in pencil, putting a floppy disk for those kids out there, that's a computer term, uh, into the envelope and mailing it by US postal mail uh, to a, a journal and waiting for a letter to come back. And of course, the editor having to mail out the papers to people, and you know, it was a very uh, well, slow process, but that's what we had. My advisor was so excited the day he showed me that he could attach a digital document to an email to send to his colleague in New Zealand. Because before that, they were mailing each other back copies with red ink all over it to, to come to a final product. Uh, so when we talked about method sections earlier. Of course you can't put everything in a method section uh, to reproduce your experiment. Uh, there's just not enough, uh, well, it might not be the most interesting use of your journal space. Plus. Journals have typically been uh, ink on paper, bound, mailed, and you open it up. You literally have, the journal only has so many pages that they can print. As an editor of a journal, we had a page budget of 565 pages. Any additional page over that per year was $30 uh, charged to the society. So they really wanted to encourage you to not go over that budget. But of course, you get more submissions over, as years go by, as journals get more popular, which means your rejection rate goes up, partly because you're sticking to page budgets. So now, I want to keep it short. You, where do you cut? Well, you start cutting in certain sections like the method section. But nowadays, you know, we have the internet, right? Uh, and we actually have a lot of interesting and unique ways to share information uh, that has nothing to do with the academic paper itself. Uh, as Victoria Stodden has said about her advisor, Donalo, I think it was, and I don't know where it comes from, so I'm not trying to take credit for it, but the academic paper itself is not the scholarship. It is a flyer advertising your scholarship. What you've done from the beginning of the research process to the end, uh, well, there's never truly an end, that represents the scholarship. So we can only put so much in that paper, but nowadays we can do so much more, and I won't go into all of those details, but there's a lot of excellent stuff being done in what it's called open notebook. Uh, there's lots of things that can be done uh, in terms of sharing information. Like it, if you're running a study, you have all of your study materials together so you can give to your participants. It's already together. There's no reason why you can't also share it with other researchers and make it publicly available, uh, or unless, of course, it's copyrighted, uh, uh, and then you have to be careful there, as well as a lot of work on how to ethically share data sets, uh, and that's being done uh, a lot right now. The Canadian government actually is doing a great job with this. They have something called Open Government. You can go to opengov.ca, and you can download thousands of data sets uh, of data collected by the Canadian government, and it will have an Excel file, and it will have a metadata file. And so if you're interested in work on spousal abuse, you can get the statistics for that. If you're interested in work on bullying in schools, you can get the statistics on that. And they've made a commitment to say that all government-funded research needs to be available and open uh, uh, going forward, and they're working on steps to implement that. My research is government-funded research. Almost everyone in Canada that does research is funded by three councils, that is the government. So there might be mandates coming from above uh, for being more open and transparent. So even if you don't like it or don't think it's useful, it behooves you to be aware of what's going on. Also, there is, well, it depends on how you want to look at it. Some people call it a perverse incentive structure, but an incentive structure in academia that can lead to the, as what Smoldino and McElreath called it, the natural selection of bad science. Uh, for instance, practices to further publication instead of discovery. It's not always a juxtaposition between the two, of course. But Smoldino um, and McElreath. McElreath has uh, an excellent book on Bayesian statistics analysis, and Smoldino is a, a, a primo uh, modeler uh, and very focused on the theory and so on. They actually used evolutionary theory uh, and looking at you know, natural selection processes and built in certain assumptions into the model and found that it's incentive structures that kind of been, uh, focus on publishing more uh, over time can lead to uh, kind of less ideal or less optimal uh, scientific practices uh, down the line. Now, you, ha you have to take their uh, uh, kind of a description of what those practices are, of course, uh, and, uh, and test or look at the assumptions in their own models uh, and take that with a grain of salt. 
Now, in a paper they had published earlier, this is just, if we just take null hypothesis significance testing, and that's what most of us tend to use, not all, but a lot of us uh, tend to use, partly because that's all we're, all we're taught. They don't really know that there are other options. Uh, and you have to, again, you have to make certain assumptions here for this model to work. And one is, well, let's say the alpha level is 0.05. That's what, we, uh, that's what our error rate is going to be like. We're happy, we're comfortable making errors 5% of the time uh, down the road uh, in, our, in our research. And you assume that the statistical power of the, the research is at 80%, which, as we've seen, is not, uh, is not the average in, our, in field psychology. Uh, but it, let's, for, for the simulation, let's assume that's true. Now, you have to make a further assumption. And this is where, of course, you have to take this with a grain of salt. What's the base rate? Uh, of, an, of a hypothesis being true a priori. So in this model, say you have 100 hypotheses, and the assumption here is that 10% are, are true a priori and 90% are not true. Now, you'll find that you'll have uh, 13 positive results. With power at 0.8, you'll get 8 out of the 10. With uh, alpha 0.05, you'll get 5 uh, that are false positives. Uh, and then you'll find that, okay, now you actually, you're, uh, probability of uh, discovering like true results overall is uh, in this model 62%. Uh, so it's not, uh, there is a non-trivial number of false positives that are perhaps making it into the published literature because we typically publish significant findings, but we know based on these assumptions that we can have some false positives creep in. That can change of course as the base rate of true hypotheses rises and falls and the other assumptions rise or fall. But here's one limitation of current statistical software programs that I've noticed. When they get the results back, they're not color coded. They don't tell us which ones are false positives and which ones are, are true a priori. Of course they can't, and, uh, but the point is, we don't know. We just have to kind of say, this is what we know now. And one way of teasing that apart in science being self-correcting is to conduct both direct and conceptual replications over time. Uh, in some work that I did with Etienne LaBelle and uh, Tim Loving, we also just did some basic simulations, and uh, let's highlight here, is if you make, some folks would suggest, and again, you have to take it with a grain of salt, that the actual alpha rate in some research can be much higher than 0.05, partly because of the use of QRPs and so on. So let's say 35% as an estimate or an assumption in a model. And now you take different uh, suggestions and you adjust the alpha rate to 0.05, but keep power relatively low at 0.25, or you, alpha's 0.05 and you have the power to 0.8 or the power to 0.95. And now the base rate of true hypotheses is either uh, 0.10 or 0.25. And we can look at, okay, given these assumptions, what are the proportion of studies yielding true positives? And you have, you have that there. Proportion of studies yielding false positives, and then the true discovery rate. And you can see in some of these uh, simulations, the true discovery rate can be particularly low, but now it can actually get fairly high, uh, but it doesn't seem to get much higher uh, when you go from power of 0.8 to 0.95. Uh, and the number of participants you would need to go from 0.80 to 0.95 can actually increase exponentially, so perhaps suggests an 80% uh, percent, uh, power rate uh, perhaps is somewhat optimal. But these are just some assumptions to kind of look at what the rate of uh, the true discovery rate would be given these conditions. There's actually, if, uh, these slides are available and uh, there's links, so there's a, uh, a shiny app. Oh, no, there's a shiny app you can go to and you can change all the assumptions and see how things change. Uh, this is already brought up earlier. So, you know, in teaching science, you know, tell, talking to the students, you know, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. I still, sometimes, when you have that data and you press that button and you wait for it to come back and a number pops up, you're just hoping, please, let there be something there. Uh, in terms of, I want my study to have worked. There's a lot of excitement there. And part of that is because sometimes you feel you need to have a significant result in order to publish something. And if you don't, then you've wasted, say, X number amount of months or years uh, in order to uh, running that study. So now, that is a strong motivation, perhaps, to see, well, hmm, what if I remove an outlier? What if I, and you go down the line, and now you have an inflated alpha rate, and you may have just picked up on noise. Now, in terms of replications, and now moving to the, the class project, you know, I just, this is just one kind of way of conceptualizing it. And you can think of types of replications. It's not direct or conceptual. Uh, almost all research is a conceptual replication of some sort, uh, both building on what we feel we already know, uh, and then just changing things uh, to some degree. 
Uh, but what was also pointed out earlier, there's no such thing as a, an exact uh, kind of a direct replication where everything is exactly the same. Partly because the contextual variables will always be different. A different time of uh, uh, year, uh, a different cohort, uh, you know, different uh, sample, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So you can have the same IV operationalization, you can have the same DV operationalization, the same stimuli for both the IV and DV, the same procedural details, and the same physical setting as best as you can, but there's always something a little bit different. And then moving further away from, say, exact uh, to, say, very far, you start to kind of you know, lose some of those other things. Now, I want to study loneliness and, uh, say, uh, uh, making yourself feel better based on, say, uh, temperature cues. Well, maybe now, instead of do doing this correlationally, I'm going to take people that uh, and measure their loneliness, and I'm going to randomly assign them to a sauna condition. And I'm going to put them in a sauna that's quite warm, or I'm going to put, put them in one that's off, or I'm going to put them in a room that's warm. You see where I'm going with this. You can start to change it up. You're just testing the same hypothesis, but you're just switching up the details of the study. And uh, now that's kind of, you're moving it in a different direction, uh, testing it, uh, the boundary conditions, seeing where the effect may exist and seeing where the effect may not exist. So, you can say that when I taught this methods class, before it used to be, okay, all the students would write a, a paper, like a research proposal, uh, and, you know, really focus on the methods and so on and so, so forth. And, uh, uh, they didn't really enjoy the assignment. I didn't really enjoy reading the papers. And uh, it didn't seem to kind of be particularly beneficial. And I thought, well, why don't we take a more hands-on approach? What if we actually work on a project together? But, uh, and like I say, uh, kind of through the back door, teach uh, this better scientific practices, more open and reproducible scientific practices, by having them do something, uh, and in this case, a replication study, and then at the end, they'll have this tool set and this skill set uh, to uh, implement in their own uh, research programs going forward. So in Canada, our weeks, our, our, our classes are 13 weeks long. So we don't have a lot of time, so we're necessarily focusing on studies that can be run fairly, uh, fairly quickly. But outside of the lab, we've done some replications of our own work, as well as others' work that actually have taken up to a year or more to conduct because they're a lot more complex. So that is a limitation uh, here, but it's more about the exercise of engaging in this uh, replication study than the, the studies of, of, of interest. So what we do is we assemble in groups. And what I do is, uh, depending on how many are in the class, it'll say, what is everyone interested in? Some folks, uh, the last time I taught it, were interested in relationship processes and sexuality. Okay, there's three of you. You work together. Uh, a bunch of people, actually a lot of them are interested in issues of socioeconomic status and greed and fairness. And there's a lot of cool research on that right now. So they assembled in a couple of different groups. So now they're assembled based on their interest. And the goal for them, for that first week, was to look into the more recent literature uh, and to identify studies that are of interest to you, that are relevant to your own research that you, you like, but also are discussed in enough detail and clarity that you feel that they'd be a, a good uh, like target for a replication attempt because we could implement it in the lab. And they, they do that. And they usually will bring back three to four papers. I'll pop them up on the screen, we'll read through, and we'll go over them as a group, and then we'll read a little bit more closely, and it's always a little eye-opening because they'll be like, huh, okay, we don't know what, there's not enough information here uh, for us to really uh, understand what they did. Uh, but in this other study, this is fairly clear. And we, we kind of go through, we decide for what they should uh, a, a approach for the replication project in that group. Now what they do first, because I've always been, I've always tried to do it this way. Don't contact an original author and say, can you give us all your stuff? You're asking them to do a lot of work for you. Instead, what we do is we read through the paper very carefully and write what we call a replication uh, report. And we try to reproduce as best we can all the procedures, the methods, as well as the materials. And then we, also, then we put in a, like, you know, highlights and so on where we need additional information. In 0% of the cases that I've done any sort of replication project have we been able to actually reproduce the methods and materials 100% uh, uh, without contacting the original author. Fair enough, uh, but this opens the eyes of the students because we're like, wow, I, we can't read this paper and then do what they did because it's not a, the materials aren't available anywhere else. 
Now, what's going to happen is 50 years down the road, that will just be lost to science because those people won't be in academia anymore. They might be dead. Uh, they might not have you know, anything that can read a floppy disk. Uh, so we suggest showing the students how now if you make your own research more open and reproducible, it will have a longer shelf life down the road. We send an email uh, and, the and the replication report itself to the corresponding author. And we, so it's like, hey, here's what we're doing. This is our project. And there, there's a link for an example of one. Uh, we, this is why we're doing this. Here's what we'd like to do. Would you please take a look at this and tell us if there's anything that we're missing and include uh, any of the relevant study materials that we still need and, and so on and so forth. What I'll say is in the five cases that, uh, uh, that we've, uh, or the five groups that we've run so far, the corresponding author responded positively within 24 hours and we got all the information for all the studies. And we continued to work closely with the authors and it seemed to be, it worked fine because we're interested in the effect, not the personalities. Update is necessary, and you usually need to update. Even one time after we ran a first replication study, we went back to the author and sh said, here are all the results. Is there anything, can you think of anything we may have missed? And like, oh, yeah, yeah, we actually asked a few more questions after manipulation. Here they are. They just kind of forgot, and, uh, and they gave it to us later. After that, we obtain ethics. So that can take a while, as you know. But here's the nice thing. So we'll submit an ethics package, and while we're waiting, I don't know if I have this next. Uh, I'll just put that up. But while we're waiting, we can actually write uh, the, the scripts that we require to analyze the data based on our initial expectations and what was done by the original author. And then sometimes we'll actually say, here's some other analyses that we'd like to conduct because, uh, which was kind of alluded to earlier, was, well, we, we didn't think that original analysis was ideal and we would like to do this other analysis. So then we say, we're gonna do that one as well, as an example. At this point, we also engage in open science practices. So the open science framework, uh, the osf.io, they create their own pages. We, all, well, we communicate through that. Uh, and we put all the study materials, methods, uh, hypotheses, and rationale, and our data analytic plans, et cetera. Uh, and, and we uh, put that up so that it's there for all of us to share, and it's there for others to see going forward. And then we collect and analyze the data. And the nice thing is when the data comes in, uh, we've already have our uh, pre-registered a um, data analytics script for the replication analyses at least. And then we are able to go because we already have, we, we're prepared. And then, uh, and then we usually contact the original author with the outcome of the results, ask for additional information perhaps uh, as, as needed, and then uh, they write a report for the class. So now this is a brief report that explains what they've done and what they found. And then in all instances so far, We've, at minimum, collected a second sample after the class had completed. Uh, in one case, we collected four samples. In one case, we collected three samples. But in all the cases, we collect at least two. Part of it is to try to, well, it doesn't fully account for it, but take into account like random measurement error uh, and also that uh, you know, a larger n across different uh, uh, samples can be, uh, give the, the original hypothesis a fair test. Uh, well, just give it a fair test. Oh, and not like I say published. So in this case, there is a tangible outcome for the, for the students. Uh, they, they like this because they feel that they can get something out of it. There's no guarantee of, say, publication. But what we do is uh, we, we, we write it up, and we usually send it to the, uh, the journal that published the original research. Uh, in a few cases, they, they published it. In a couple, we went to some, this other journal for different reasons. But it's been published in the first journal we've sent it to in all five cases. And these are all considered you know, good journals in the field of social psychology. Uh, and the students, uh, they, they kind of, they really feel like a sense of group identity after they've gone through this project together. The lessons learned so far, the methods and procedures of public studies are difficult to reproduce. So to separate, to reproduce something is just to recreate what they did. Uh, and so in that case, like I say, in 0% of the cases have we been able to fully reproduce things so far. And I try to teach the students to, how to make it so that other people could reproduce your research without necessarily having to contact you, uh, you know, making it available. And there's a lot of different things that we talk about and how to do that. Of course, that can be difficult in some cases. But like I say, at some point, you're not going to be able to respond to email. And then your science is kind of lost. Data analyses of published studies are difficult to reproduce. In one instance, we glossed over this when we read the paper. They said, in our analysis, we also controlled for ethnic uh, ethnicity. 
That, that was all that was really said. And then when we actually had the data in hand, we're looking at it, it's like, whoa, they measured 11 ethnicities. How did they statistically control for it? You don't just randomly <laughs> give them a number of one to 11. Uh, like, uh, so we had to get, go back to them and say, we're curious how you went about doing this. You say you did it, but you didn't share how you did it, so we can't reproduce the analysis. And they're like, oh, we just, everyone that was Caucasian, we gave them a zero, and everyone else, they got a one. So that was just the Caucasian's predictor variable. And we're like, okay. Uh, so, uh, and in one other instance, uh, we actually discovered a, a typo. It was just a typo, but when we're trying to do a meta-analysis of the effects, it was showing that their original effect was wildly non-significant, but in their paper, they said it was wildly significant. It was a copy and paste error, a standard error from the prior uh, reported result. So we talk in that class about double checking, as well as really cool new stuff for writing reproducible manuscripts uh, that uh, automatically input all your statistics from your data set that doesn't involve you cutting and pasting. That's the future, and uh, it's fun and scary. It's scary, because I'm older. Being nice to original authors is the way to go. There's, I see no value in being a dick, right? To email someone and say, you know, hey, we're doing this thing about your research, you know. You, you see where I'm going with that. No, these students are genuinely, genuinely interested in this effect. This is something that they're using in their own research, and they really do like their research. And we've picked it for a reason, because we think it actually was uh, set up and written very clearly uh, for others to reproduce. And they've all been nice to us. One of the original authors uh, actually was a reviewer on the paper and said, look, I worked with these authors through the entire process. They did everything that said they were going to do. They took all my suggestions there, and I think they've done a fair job, and I think this should be published, and sometime down the road, I'm likely gonna write a response or collect some new data, uh, but for the time being, I think this should be published. And I was like, yeah, that was the highest praise I think that the students could get for their work from original author, uh, whose work they, they didn't get results consistent with the original effect, and I'll show you what that is in just a minute. I'll uh, wrap this up here in just a moment. Published re results can be difficult to replicate. So as we know, effect sizes in published studies are usually bigger than in replication studies. And that's what we always seem to find uh, as well in ours. We always use much larger samples uh, and uh, over multiple studies and we meta-analyze the effect. So we're less interested in a p-value or more interested in seeing what's the estimate and sensitivity of the effect size. But we find the most important part of the paper is the methods and, resu uh, the methods and results section. As I joke, the introduction discussion sections are less useful if studies are not reproducible. Uh, and uh, they're good things to read to your kids at bedtime, puts them right out. Uh, <laughs> but with the methods paper, that's what you need to, that's the most important part. But it doesn't all have to be in the methods section. It could be in a variety of locations. Uh, it can be in supplementary material, it can be in methods videos uh, that you can watch how a study is conducted, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different ways of uh, uh, making a lot of things available, but not in your paper itself. And statistical power is, is obviously very important. If you're going to be using null hypothesis significance testing, then it doesn't care. Uh, the, law, the, the laws of statistical inference based on NHST don't care about your resources. Uh, they don't care how difficult it is to obtain data and so on. Uh, it's just, you know, so statistical power is important. And studies that have very low N, you're going to get, a large, for the most part, overestimated effect sizes. Uh, that uh, you're not going to replicate that effect size with that same sample size. <clears throat> this is a screenshot of one study that was conducted for that class. It, you may have heard of this study, the uh, Doug Kenrick and colleagues years ago, they had men and women come into the lab and men viewed Playboy centerfolds or abstract art. Women viewed Playgirl centerfolds or abstract art. And then they had them rate how much they love their partner and how attracted they are to their current partner. And they found that men in the abstract art condition reported more love for their partner than men in the Playboy centerfold condition. They suggested this is a contrast effect. Men are focused more on physical appeal and attraction in general. Lots of research has uh, suggested that to be the case. Not that women don't focus on a physical attraction, just men tend to focus on it more. And they felt that, well, the men are looking at all these beautiful women, and they're contrasting it to their current partner, who's not likely a Playboy centerfold model, but in rare instances, maybe. I heard some stories earlier. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and uh, so now it's like, well, it's a contrast effect, so now they're going to report less love for their partner. And so they were, this is a study that was published in 1989. The, there's 15 men in the abstract art condition, 15 men in the experimental condition. And uh, the, I'll show you uh, the results here in a moment. Uh, in the original, but this is still a study that is discussed a great deal in all psychology textbooks on attraction and evolutionary psychology. And it's also a study that is used quite a bit by uh, 
right-wing political folks to suggest that uh, pornography is indeed a public health risk. And it, that was not the original intent of the authors when they published it. They're interested in contrast effects in evolutionary psychology, <laughs> not, uh, not banning porn. So uh, this is just an example here. We made our code available as well. It forced me to learn R to do meta-analyses. And so now, uh, and there's something, I won't go into it now, there's something even cooler, a code ocean, where you can do all the reproducible analyses in the cloud and, and you don't have to do a thing. It's all there for you. You just press buttons and change code if you like. But you can go to this site right now, download this, download, uh, and run it, and it'll reproduce the meta-analyses that we presented in the paper. So the original study found an effect size of 0.91 which is, again, large, but look at the range, 0.16 to 1.66. A very, very small effect, right up to one of the largest effects in social psychology ever. So that's the original finding. But again, still very interesting and, and uh, theoretically uh, consistent with what was predicted. We did run the study three different times, and the third time we ran it, we had a, uh, a different sample, not just a, an online sample, we had an in-lab sample, and we also added a new condition to, to, to see if, uh, it's not just, say, n nude images. I don't know if you've looked, not, I don't really like uh, scan the pages of Playboy or Playgirl that often, but when you uh, look at the stimulus material, uh, it is kind of, it's like, oh, this seems weird. Like, why would a guy be standing like this, uh, right? Uh, it's just, it doesn't seem like a natural pose. Uh, but uh, it, now that there's a lot of uh, like more uh, pictures of men and women that they're clothed, but they're just standing like a cowboy hat in a field of wheat with jeans on, looking sexy. And we thought maybe that would be better than like, you know, these, all these men with uh, erections. Uh, and so we, we tried to change, change it up. Long story short, we, we found inconsistent results, and I'm just showing you that uh, there. And I, uh, that's just a, a secondary analysis. The take-home message for the students, and this is again at the end, saying, hey, this is what we can take from this for your own research going forward. <laughs> do your best, it, it'll never be perfect, but do your best to make your own research <laughs> reproducible. It can be very helpful. Like I say, if I do a study right now that's uh, all the materials and code and data and so on is publicly available. 50 years from now, people might be looking at that study more and using it more than another study studying a similar topic that doesn't have that available. It, that's a hypothesis. Replicate your own results when feasible. It might not always be feasible. I do studies with married couples over a period of a year or two. I'm not gonna say, oh, no, I'm just gonna hold off on publishing until I get another grant and run that study again for another two years, right? Uh, so it's not about trying to replicate everything, but when you can, uh, attempt to do that. And so one way that we attempt to do that in our own lab now with our own original research is a cross-validation. Your test, you have your exploratory test sample and your confirmatory secondary sample. And you get a large sample, randomly split it up, and it's kind of like a, like a machine learning type of approach. Uh, but now you can kind of build in replication uh, to uh, your, your existing projects. And we find that it's a nice uh, double sieve, as it were, such that certain things <laughs> fall out in the first study and not all of them fall out in the, in the replication sample, uh, but now we feel a little more confident in those ones. Research is hard, especially in social sciences of predicting human behavior. We're all very unpredictable. <laughs> and the results of one study with a p-value less than 0.05, they're suggestive, but they're not definitive. And that's fair, that's, that's a scientific process. But be aware of that and don't write it up as if perhaps it is definitive. And I'll leave it at that, thank you very much. Well, there's a, a lot of folks suggest uh, taking great caution and looking at post hoc power. Uh, that's obviously a factor of a lot of things. And uh, so what you want to do is perhaps going into the study to the best of your ability, don't say I have to have power, like we don't know what the effect size is going to be, if, if it in fact exists, is uh, what Yuri Simon says, just do what you can afford. If you're an archaeologist and you really want to go digging in New Zealand but you can't afford it, then maybe you need to dig in New Jersey because uh, you know, he's close to New Jersey. So you might say, look, I can only afford the sample size to, to look at an effect size of 0.5 or greater. So I'll do that. And if I don't find anything, I'm not going to conclude that there's no effect. I'll just say that if there is an effect, it's likely smaller than 0.5. Uh, but that's what I can afford. So look at it beforehand, not necessarily after. But as a graduate student, I will say there's a couple initiatives that are um, 
Well, and it's not just limited to, say, social personality psychology, even though I think it kind of start there. Uh, one's called the Psychological Science Accelerator. That is a collection of three, over 300 labs all over the world, and there's a central administrative structure of just people like me uh, who are just volunteering their time, uh, and essentially you can suggest, here's a study I'd like to run, and then it goes through a selection process, and then if it's kind of chosen, then you'll get, up, in some cases, up to 50, 60, 70 labs all over the world to kind of collect data for that study with the goal of looking at generalizability as well as being able to test uh, it, your, that effect in different cultures at the same time. So utilizing collective resources, because I, I have extra participants I could run in my own lab, but I'm not, but we could, uh, right? So, and then they can help us out. Linked to that, but separate, uh, if not this big vetting process, it's called uh, study swap. And it's on the open science framework. And you can post haves and wants. You can say, I have this capacity. Do you want me to run a study for you? Or I have wants. I would like the people to help me collect this study. There's a massive one on there right now uh, from an evolutionary psych perspective looking at uh, uh, different facial characteristics and cues and so on, being led by Ben Jones, I believe. And, so, and that's getting a lot of attention. So as a student, you could say, well, here are some options that I have to get uh, larger samples. And also, if, you, if you're a developmental psychologist, there's a cool project called the Many Babies Project. You know how hard it is to get babies to come into a lab and like, not fall asleep or spit up while they're doing one of your studies? Well, now you can actually collaborate with labs that have 10 babies each, and you can all run kind of share babies, as it were, uh, and uh, collect more data to have greater statistical power. And that's, uh, oh, I forget his name off the top of my head, but brilliant guy, and uh, it's, it's a very, very solid project, and especially that is a very hard to reach target population, uh, so that's been, been very helpful. And lastly, because I like to bloviate, uh, especially for graduate students, there's, uh, as hinted at earlier, a uh, form of uh, publication called registered reports. Uh, it could be useful for, say, particularly, say, confirmatory research where you have a particular hypothesis and a way of testing it. You write the paper up, sans data or analyses, but you suggest what, how would you do the analyses, what you'd expect to find, and then you could also build in, of course, I'll explore afterward, and, but I'll, I'll say that they're exploratory analyses. And then you get in principle acceptance ahead of data collection. So when you finish the project, you know that you have a publication. It's going to be published there. Chris Chambers is leading that because he, he would say, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think I, uh, he would say this, uh, that you evaluate the quality of the science not based on the results, but based on the methods. And, you sh and uh, if, if you look at the results to judge the quality of the study, then that's not the, scientific, uh, the best ideal scientific process according uh, to that perspective. So he's been really championing registered reports. Over 100 journals have a registered report section now. And as a graduate student, you don't have to hope that you have PLS in Final Five. You just have to hope that you are able to run the study as rigorously as you suggested you would. Sorry for that long winded answer. Thank you. That was very helpful. Sure. Uh, <coughs> well, I was very impressed by the. Uh, Pedagogical games we have by having your uh, class and your students actually do research. I think that's a terrific thing, and you learn by doing, and you learn how science works, and but. that's terrific. <laughs> well, it's not really a lot. Okay. <laughs> I'm just having fun. Here. But the, uh, <laughs> uh, I would say that there's a question about whether it's better to have the class trying to replicate previous result or just new research. I think there may be concerns um, that are imposed by replicating that may be beneficial relative to just carrying out their own research project on something else. So I guess there's a need to um, uh, be very precise about many things if you're trying to replicate. That, that could be beneficial. So I think that's fine too. One of the questions is um, whether a uh, scientist him or herself should decide that it's a good idea to spend effort replicating as opposed to carrying out new research, which is a different question. Mm -hmm. Because the, pedagog the uh, pedagogical gains may be less important than the gains for science may be more important. And then it becomes a question of where you want to put your effort. Should you spend your effort trying to replicate previous results? Maybe it's very important. There might be reason to. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen examples in physics we heard about where you know replicating is very important. Um, or should you uh, extend previous results rather than replicating conceptual replications, or should you just forge new directions? That's an individual decision by scientists. 
a little different. But as far as the uh, learning, as far as the pedagogical gains, I think what you've done is terrific. I think you ought to be uh, introduced as many places as possible, even though it requires a lot of effort, probably on your part. <laughs> yes, yeah. all work. and money. Can I say one thing I would like to, to follow up on? And I just want to say, I, I agree. Uh, it, it is to some extent a zero-sum game. If I only have so many resources, then I, I, if I spend them on doing one thing, I'm spending less on another thing, right? Uh, that is, and all researchers kind of face that. So uh, I've chosen to focus some of my resources on this front, and it, particularly in an educational context. But you're right, there are other things that you could do. So I'm not trying to suggest that this is and I'm not saying you suggested, I was suggesting uh, that everyone should do this, this is the best way of, of focusing on it. I just thought, what could I do to make it a little more involving for the students? Also, one reason for the replication was to kind of teach them how to be nice academic citizens and so be critical, but realize there's a person attached to that and to be nice and to, to be open and honest with why you're doing this project and share with them your results and ask them for input and not kind of be sniping on, on Twitter or Facebook discussion groups and questioning everyone's motives. Uh, like, they're, if people want to do that, fine. I don't like to do that so much myself, uh, and I don't know if how valuable it is, but if you kind of teach them how to be, you know, you know, just in the research context, a good academic citizen, then hopefully that will carry on as well, because they'll, re they'll realize what it would be like if someone contacted them asking them for their own uh, research materials and all that, right? Uh, okay, well, oh, now th uh, that could put me in a weird position. So learning kind of people skills that way. Anyways, thank you. So I have a kind of follow-up question, which is, uh, so do you think there should be more value placed on replication studies by the community as a whole? Right? So you found it valuable pedagogically. You've emphasized that with the internet, there's a lot of availability, uh, means of communication that are open to us. But Ultimately, there's going to be a question of how you spend your time and how you're rewarded for that. Sure. So you've got tenure, you don't have to worry in the same way, but the... I, I sit at home in my underwear in those days. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, do you want to see more incentives to do this? And sure. Yeah. Well, I, I guess from my experience so far, every, any, uh, any replication study that I've been a part of has been published. So uh -huh. I, I find it hard to say from my experience that it's not incentivized. Uh, that it's not taken seriously because you know we've we've done it. In the very first one we did, uh, we published a psychological science, uh, and the original author he was asked if he wanted to write a response, and he wrote back and he said, you know what, no, uh, it, they 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 did everything they said they're going to do. Uh, I provided feedback. Uh, they shared with me the results. They are what they are, and I'm. It stands for itself. And it was like, wow, we, there was no rancor there. It was just that's how you go about doing it. So. I think it actually is becoming more incentivized, and of course, we don't want it to be running around doing direct, direct replications all the time, or else we've discovered nothing new. Uh, you know, we need to kind of expand on this, but I do see that there's a place for it. But uh, it's up to individuals at this point. But my experience so far has been 100% success rate with publication because I like to think that we're doing it right. Of course, we could do it better. We always can do better. But I like to think that we're going about it properly. And so far, the academic community has been open to that. Let me give one quick example of something. I, I know people have to get to the airport. Uh, you may be familiar with what's called the ovulatory shift hypothesis, and, uh, where uh, women that are not taking any form of hormonal birth control uh, at the time of ovulation, there's been a whole host of things that have been discovered. They find men that are more symmetrical, attractive, men that have more masculine facial features, attractive, apparently wear uh, the color red on their clothing more, apparently wear clothing that shows more skin relative to when they're not ovulating, uh, and higher sexual desire around that time as well, in addition to many other things. One group of researchers published a meta-analysis. They are evolutionary psychologists, and they, not surprisingly, found lots of support for this in the, in the published literature. Another group of scholars who are, uh, that don't really value evolutionary psychology, perhaps not surprisingly, with the same literature found zero support for the hypothesis. Uh, and it's like, okay, great. Well, there are issues with meta-analyses. But this other group of researchers that do have some evolutionary kind of thinking in, in their research, but are open to ideas and so on, new ideas and so on, did a very large scale, more than one of course, but they've done several <laughs> large scale uh, studies that don't just try to replicate but extend a little bit. And what seems to have fallen out now in the past, well, two months, uh, now that they, they've all been published. There does seem to be an effect uh, on sexual desire. Women not taking hormonal birth control around the time of ovulation, at least using these particular methods of detecting, uh, tend to report greater sexual desire overall compared to when they're not ovulating. But nothing else really seems to pan out. 
not all these little cute effects with the good genes hypotheses and so on. That doesn't mean they're not true. It just means the way they've been studied so far uh, doesn't allow a, a, a kind of strong evaluation of that. So there's a case where some replication research has come in that is not just direct, but it's also trying to expand uh, somewhat, and it's really helping uh, find the boundary conditions of this effect. Uh, stay tuned, I'm sure there's going to be more to come by other researchers who will say, well, actually, uh, and then we'll see where that goes. It, sorry, did you have a yeah. um, uh, Just a uh, comment Can, can you on use the mic? Comment on whether replication depends on field. There's a short story by Jorge Luis Borges called Pierre Maynard, author of the Quixote, where a 20th century person has as their task in life to rewrite Don Quixote word for word and succeeds. And, and it was then better. Borges points out, giving you a sentence which is identical in both novels, saying, notice the difference in meaning. <laughs> and that's true, because a 17th century writer is different from a 20th century writer, and the same sentence does not necessarily have the same meaning. You know, maybe related to it, but uh, I was, there's a cool podcast, and now they're writing the philosophy department, The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Have you ever heard? Uh, but, so there's like 300 or so episodes now, and I listened to the first 28 before I started to burn out. Uh, but uh, they had, uh, he had as a guest this uh, expert on uh, like uh, pre-Socratic uh, philosophy. And you know, the, the, is it Heracl Heraclitus? Uh, I see, I knew it. I should have tried. I should have just said, what is it? And then you could have told me. Okay, but the idea was, there's that old quote, right? You can, you can never step in the same river twice. Mm -hmm. And of course, apparently, uh, different people with their different knowledge of Greek in, their, in that time can actually interpret that sentence a little bit differently into English, and that different meaning can actually have very different philosophical meanings from, from that. And I was like, you know, blown away again. That's why I have to slow down on that uh, podcast. But speaking to that point a little bit, I just thought it was a fun uh, side, side example. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I just want to, uh, it's not a question, I want to follow okay. up on, uh, on your remark about Borjas and recommend it. It's interest anyone. So, Yamila um, Brennan, she was my advisor, and she wrote a whole chapter about three stories of Borjas. One of them, Pierre Menard, the other one. So, discussing this concept of replication, what does it mean to do the same thing again? when it comes to language and when it comes to universal laws. So what does it mean that the law is um, reused? Um, I think it's a, it's a beautiful chapter, and uh, if you're interested, uh, just look her up. It's Ben Menachem. Uh, it's also in the book that we put on, Sitting in the Setting River Twice, but you don't have to get the book. You can just find her chapter. And uh, it, it, I think it... It shows very nicely some of the complications and some of the achievements of replication. And I want to say thank you so much for this for this unique experience. I don't think I've ever been to a conference when I had so much dialogue time and so many fruitful new ideas coming from um, from being able to thoroughly discuss every talk that was here. It, it was amazing, and, and thank you all very much.